These two new ways of thinking changed history. They were faith and reason. Faith meant all the objective truths that we can know by faith, and reason meant all the objective truths that we can know by reason. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. You're listening to Reason and Theology, where both faith and reason intersect. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Reason and Theology show. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-host uh, Eric Ibarra. And we have today guest Dr. R.J. Mataba, who's an associate professor and dean of the Graduate School of Theology at Christendom College in Alexandria. He earned his Ph.D. from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and his master's from the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception. And he's also the author of Divine Causality and Human Free Choice, which is published by Brill. You can find a copy of it on Amazon.com. Dr. Matava, how are you today? I'm well. Thanks. It's great to be with you, Michael. Absolutely. It's great to have you. Uh, Eric, how are you doing over there? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on again. And uh I look forward to this episode. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Mutaba. Thanks. It's great to be with you too, Eric. Yes, indeed. So before I dive into the questions uh, directly, let me first ask you, are you a cradle convert or, uh, I'm sorry, a cradle Catholic or a convert <laughs> Catholic? It, it would be kind of a contradiction there, cradle convert. <laughs> well, may, may, maybe not. I am a cradle Catholic, um, but uh, hopefully still a convert, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Conversion is, is an, an essential part, I think, of, of everyday Christian life. So mm-hmm. um, we all need deeper conversion, but I am a cradle Catholic. I was raised in the Catholic Church. Um, all right. Well, so let me dive into some of these questions. You are the author of Divine Causality and Human Free Choice. I, I find this fascinating because it seems to mainly deal with the De Auxilis controversy um, in the Roman Catholic Church, which is essentially, from the best that I can understand, a controversy uh, that deals with the issue of grace and man's uh, freedom, divine causality, and human free choice, um, which also, from what I understand, deals with the issue of, you know, how can God predestine some people, yet people can still be free? Is that essentially correct? Yeah, that's right. So my study has to do with this controversy between mainly the Dominicans and Jesuits of the 16th and early 17th centuries. So this is right after the Council of Trent. And there were some questions that Trent left unsettled, despite all the, all the questions that it did settle, at least for Catholics, in response to Luther and Calvin's teachings on grace and on justification, the bondage of the will. Um, so that's what I looked at. And at the heart of that controversy was this question about the efficacy of God's grace. So Trent had taught that uh, God has the initiative in salvation, um, that when one is justified, God takes the first step but not without grace. Uh, God's grace prevenes, and, and yet one can resist. Uh, God's grace is not such that it makes it impossible for someone to resist. It doesn't take away free will. Trent even taught that, that not even the fall uh, totally eradicates free will, even though it, it does uh, harm the whole of man, uh, and all of his faculties. So Trent was clarifying against some of the teachings of the reformers that, that free will is not eradicated. It's not taken away. Uh, they disagreed with the bondage of the will thesis, but they left unclarified certain questions about the nature of, of grace's efficacy. And so what the Dominicans and Jesuits were arguing about was this distinction that was a relatively recent one, so post-medieval distinction between uh, efficacious and sufficient grace, And the question for them was, when it came to efficacious actual grace, God moving someone to act, to a meritorious good act, uh, was the efficacy of grace something that was an intrinsic feature of the grace, or was the efficacy determined by the recipient? In other words, is it up to you and your openness to God's grace that renders it effective? That was the trajectory that Switzerland, whereas the Dominicans uh, and others that were aligned with them in the Thomas School said that grace is intrinsically and infallibly efficacious. So it's, um, it's kind of an interesting question. Historically, it comes at an important period. It's, you can see just from when it falls that it's closely related to uh, the Protestant Reformation, but also more, even more closely to certain less uh, famous Catholic theological debates like the, over the teachings of Michael Bias and uh, Jansenius, the Jansenist controversy. 
Um, and, and you're right, too, to see the connections with uh, things like predestination. In my book, I didn't deal uh, at any great length with some of these applied theological questions. I did get into justification a little bit, um, but I didn't, didn't go into any kind of detailed treatment of predestination. But I think that's because in order to get traction on those questions, it's necessary to first kind of set the, the philosophical groundwork. And that's mainly what I was trying to do, kind of some of that philosophical theological spade work that puts you in a position to be able to look at some of these applied issues, and whether that's justification or predestination or something like biblical inspiration or any number of other issues that this touches on. It's really kind of a bedrock issue, which is part of what has um, understand so there's there's a lot of directions that one could go, uh, mm-hmm. having sorted the life to get a little more clarity on the underlying uh, issues. Sure. Well, well, let me ask you this because you talked about prevenient grace uh, just a moment ago. So, um, in your your research, would you say that it's the case that God gives everybody prevenient grace, sufficient grace, if I'm understanding the term correctly, sufficient grace to be saved, but He does not necessarily give everybody. Uh, efficacious grace that is actually going to um, uh, cause the individual to not only uh, be in union with Christ, but to persevere. Um, And if he does not give that persevering, efficacious grace, if I'm using the terms correctly, if he does not give them to everybody, why does he he pick some and, 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 you know, pass over others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a key question. And I think that there is a true sense in which we can talk about sufficient and efficacious grace. The, the, that nomenclature gets a little bit thorny because it tends to conjure up a picture in our mind of um, God giving us something, right? There's God, then there's his grace, and the grace is either one kind or the other, and we need it to be one kind to actually make it to heaven, and if it's not that kind, then we're, there's no way we're making it, right, on this view. And, and that's, that tends to lead us into difficulties that I think are more of a projection of our way of thinking than what we've actually got in Scripture or in the tradition. So I would say it's true that God does uh, make his grace available to everyone. We see this in Scripture and in, in St. Paul. We see it. Um, also in some of the church's interventions and some of these related theological controversies. For example, uh, one of the propositions of the Jansenists was uh, a thesis on limited atonement, right? And so that was one of the theses that the magisterium censured uh, and and said that Christ didn't die to just save some, but he died uh, in order to save all. Um, We see more recently in the Second Vatican Council, Gaudi Metzpez, probably the most famous uh, paragraph of the Council, getting at Spes 22, um, this idea that God, uh, through the Incarnation, by becoming man, has united himself in some sense or associated himself in some way with every man and desires all to be saved. So we've got to take seriously uh, God's universal salvific will. Um, God does truly desire uh, the salvation of all, and it makes possible the salvation of every human individual. But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily entail, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that, in fact, every individual is saved, because we've got the other issue, which is that human persons have freedom, and they have bad, bad options over which to exercise freedom. So it's possible to stand, it's possible to resist God's grace, it's even possible to hate. So uh, hell is a real possibility, and if we take at least the plain sense of the New Testament at, at, uh, at face value, it looks like it's more than a possibility, but that, um, but that there is a hell, that there is a populated hell that seems to be part of the tradition. And so I know that that has come into some question in, in contemporary theology, but I think that, uh, you know, if we, it's, it's pretty hard to make sense of, of Christ preaching the Gospels if we don't, mm. we don't go that route. Mm-hmm. So what we've got is, is a God who wills to save all, and who does desire to, he desires to save all and he makes the means available, but it's in this matrix that involves our free response. And one of the possibilities is that we can resist that grace. So uh, that doesn't mean that the, in, in those who are saved, right, the grace was efficacious, obviously, because they're, they're saved. You're looking at it from the end point. And those who aren't saved, well, the grace isn't efficacious. If they're not saved, again, looking at it from the end point, um, if, they're, if they're not saved, then the grace didn't bear the fruit that it was given to bear. But then the mistake 
the very tempting mistake for us is, is to make is to think that somehow God didn't do what that person needed in order to make their salvation possible. And I think that's where we start um, breaking down our understanding of the reality of human freedom, that uh, if what God is bringing about is truly a free human choice, then everything's in place that's needed for that person to make the, to, to receive grace, to, to make the right choice, to, to attain heaven in the end. Um, but the person isn't predetermined uh, by that choice. They can defect from what God offers. And the source of that defection isn't God, but rather the creature. And so one thing that I'm not elaborating here, but which is in the background of my mind, is this idea that evil is privation. It's not something created by God. God sometimes puts up with it. Uh, his, his ultimate reasons for, for doing that are inscrutable. But what we're dealing with in the case of a sin is an action that isn't all that it should be. And so whatever that action has of being, of reality, that, that we have to attribute to God. And we could you know, go into more how that makes sense or why we'd want to say that. But when it comes to the privation uh, that makes the action to be a bad action, to be deficient, less than it should be, the first cause of that, of that deficiency isn't God the creator. It's, it's us. Um, so it's important, I think, to maintain this asymmetry between how God is involved with our good actions and our bad actions. And that's true of, of good and evil general. Uh, God the, the ultimate cause of, of everything that exists and so far as it exists, everything that's good. But he's, he's not causally involved with evils in the same kind of way. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're saying that <clears throat> provenient grace and efficacious grace, it's not that God is, you know, giving something that's insufficient for one and sufficient for the other. Both are sufficient for salvation. But wouldn't you say that there is a distinction between the two? God is giving, even though he might be giving sufficient grace to both, he is giving um, a different kind of grace, it would seem at least, to those who do persevere in the faith. And so um, do we know perhaps upon what basis God gives one and not the other? Is it based upon his foreknowledge or is it based upon a previous decree that God makes? And then part two is you mentioned, um, you know, deficiencies in us and the fact that we're able to resist God's grace. <clears throat> Does that necessarily mean that we have now thwarted God's will? Yeah, those are those are great questions. So um, I'm I'm the last, and and help me to uh, not lose the thread as we go back through mm -hmm. it. Um, on the last question, I, I go back to Saint Thomas and his the way that he calls upon uh, John Damascene in his in his distinction of the antecedent and consequent will of God, and, and he says, you know, to the question, is God's will always fulfilled? Uh, yes, it is always fulfilled, but we have to give a little bit fuller explanation. God does will the salvation of all. Um, at least antecedently or, or in principle, he, he truly wills uh, all to be saved. But in light of foreseen demerits or in light of our sins, um, he doesn't will uh, an individual to be saved. In other words, if you have someone who dies unrepentant, God doesn't will people to be in heaven with unrepentant mortal sin. Um, though he does will that that person not be a sinner, he does will in light of there not being a sinner that they be saved. Um, so God's will is always fulfilled. Thomas's way of talking about this is to say that, you know, what, whereas in one order, his will isn't fulfilled in, in the sort of universal perspective, his will always is fulfilled. It sheds a little bit of light on what sin is too. I mean, sin is the creature's rebellion, right? It's, it's when the creature, and, and it requires freedom, right? Not that, um, not that freedom requires the ability to sin. That's a controversial thesis. And I wouldn't say that freedom requires the ability to sin. But uh, in the world that we have, uh, freedom does entail the, the ability to sin. And clearly, uh, sin requires freedom, even if freedom doesn't require the ability to sin. And so it makes no sense to talk about someone committing a sin if they don't have the ability to determine themselves, if they're just necessitated. Um, they don't bear the kind of responsibility that would make sin uh, intelligible. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it's in light of that abuse of freedom. A creature rebels against the creator as much as lies in him. And it lies in him to do that because he has this capacity for self-determination. It's part of being in the image of God, being created rational. Um, our rationality is the basis of our, uh, of our being able to, uh, to make free choices. 
So we can pull against God and pull against his law as much as lies in us, but that's always a relative capacity because we're not infinite. We're not creators like God, ex nihilo. And so our choices are, in some ways, I think they do mirror God's creativity. Um, part of, again, what it is to be in God's image and likeness is to have this unique capacity to really be self-determining. It sets us apart from other creatures, at least here below. Um, and so we, we're kind of like God in that way, but we're, we don't create ex nihilo mm. um, in a strict sense ourselves. And so even when we pull against God's providential order by violating moral truth in our actions, um, God's universal law, right, this natural law, this provident, divine providence, the eternal law that governs the running of the, of the universe, that's always universally kind of enforced. So um, we, can, we can break that law, but only to our own detriment. We can't u- ultimately escape the, the pull of divine providence or of the mm-hmm. eternal law. So um, our ability to do that is relative. Okay. I, I lost the thread. Remind me again yeah, of yeah. the first sure. question. So the first question was, you know, you were noting that uh, God gives sufficient grace to everybody, but there is an efficacious grace that is given to those who persevere. Uh, yeah. Would you say that there is actually a real distinction between those two kinds of graces, or is it really still the same thing? The difference is on our end. And also, upon what basis does God give some efficacious grace and others merely sufficient grace? Um, is it based upon foreknowledge of their will, or is it based upon a prior decree? Yeah, so... Um In terms of the basis on which he gives the grace, this was a big part of the debate between the Dominicans and Jesuits, and it's kind of been a perennial one going back to Augustine. The the church's teaching, uh, or at least the the more traditional theological opinion that's that's been sort of soundly established on this, is that God uh, God grants his grace or God predestines um, in, in light of his own will, but not in light of foreseen merits. This actually, there were some Jesuits in the 16th century that did teach that predestination is in light of foreseen merits on their view Mm. uh god could see the future for them even the hypothetical future that's part of the molinist view of of middle Mm. knowledge Mm -hmm. and in in light of this foreknowledge of of what creatures will do or even would do in response to god's um god would predestine some to eternal glory aquinas's view augustine's view the, the the view that i think is more more established theologically is that it's not uh, in light of the creature's uh, merits that God predestines, although he does reprobate in light of foreseen demerits. That's an example there of mm. the asymmetry between his causal involvement in good and his causal involvement in evil. Um, we don't know ultimately all the reasons God has for, for acting the way he does, for creating and giving grace the way that he does. Um, but we know that he does make possible the salvation of all. Um, he has the initiative in saving, so it's not due to anything that we autonomously bring forward independently of God that gives us a basis for eternal reward. Uh, the basis for rewarding us is always in the first place from God. So we see Augustine saying this, and the church actually takes this up into some of its early documents on grace and responding to the Pelagians. They have this great line, uh, when we merit, God is crowning his own gifts. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of, one of my professors used to talk about this uh, along the analogy of children and parents. And I think that those of us who have kids can can relate to this, that um, kids want to contribute, but often what they contribute is, is so dependent upon us they want to give a Christmas gift, but we've got to take them shopping and give them the money and, or even give them the gift, which they then give again, or they want to help with dinner. And we have to do an awful lot of the work. In some ways it'd be easier if we just did it ourselves. God is, I don't want to anthropomorphize God, but there's something uh, that's a fitting metaphor. We'll say Mm -hmm. um, where when we're meriting uh, God is really crowning his own gifts. It's Mm -hmm. what he first gave to us that he's, that he's rewarding. Um, so g- returning to one of your other questions there, though, I think it's important to bring some clarity to what grace is. When we talk about sufficient and efficacious grace and the distinction between them, um, you know, isn't God giving somebody something different? Two things come to my mind that I think are, are relevant here. One is, what is grace anyway? And, and it's important to bear in mind that grace is an analogous term that means different things in different contexts. Now, sometimes it's as simple as the classical distinctions of grace. If you read any treatise in systematic theology or moral theology, um, if you read St. Thomas in the Prima Secundae and the the tract on grace, questions 109 to 114, you'll see these divisions into habitual and actual grace, Mm 
um, gratuitous grace and sanctifying grace and so on and so forth. So that, that itself already makes clear that grace is a term that names different realities. And it's interesting, too, in the New Testament, how grace is really an adapted term that originally means something more like shiny or brilliant. And, and it gets mm. massaged into context to refer to God's saving activity. So the unifying thread throughout all these different uses of the word grace is that we're always naming God's redemptive activity. You know, sometimes that's a habit. It's something that's inherent in us. Sometimes it's a, a transient motion, it's the way that some authors will describe it, right? God moving us to a meritorious good act. Sometimes it's a charism. Someone has the gift of preaching or teaching or maybe healing or even reading souls in some extraordinary cases. So grace names many different things. And so when we talk about efficacious and sufficient grace, it's true that we're talking about actual grace, not habitual grace or a charism. But uh, bear in mind what we're talking about is God's saving activity. Now, what is God's saving activity? When we're talking about a human action that's meritorious, what God is supplying, seems to me, is the being of my good action, right? What it is that God's bringing about is the reality, the existence of my performance. My, and I don't just mean performance as the execution of a choice, but my in, internal act of determining my will, the way that I do. It's, it's giving reality to that, which is the grace. Now, I realize in saying that I'm not, there, there are, obviously, there are big disagreements about this. That's what my book is getting into. Mm -hmm. There are others that take a different view, maybe in some ways a more intuitive view, where grace is, is almost like a stream of energy that is antecedent to my choice that results in my choice. What I'm saying instead is that what God's bringing about is my good choosing insofar as it's good, and that, that grace names that reality. So when we talk about efficacious and sufficient grace, um, it's important to, to, to bear in mind general rule of God talk or thinking or talking about God, which is that we don't know God in say. We don't comprehend him as he is in say. Um, rather, we know him through his created effects. And so it's very easy to lose our grip on that. Um, and it's very easy to start thinking about God and how God acts in ways that we you know, mm. relate to from our experience. But when we talk about, say, grace as God's action as efficacious or as sufficient, we have to remember that we're looking at that from the angle of the effects produced. So it's not necessarily that you've got, you know, God's got a supply on the shelf over here. He's got so many, you know, rounds of sufficient grace and so many rounds of efficacious and he loads one in and off we go, you know. Um, instead, we've got to look at what the actual results are. And, and, and we infer from the created effects what's true about God. So if we've got, in fact, someone who's dying obdurate in mortal sin, um, we can't say that God gave them efficacious grace. If we've got someone who's glorified in heaven, then clearly God did give them efficacious grace. It's also impossible to say that those graces don't differ. They've, they've clearly got to be. You've got mm -hmm. two different realities there. You've got a choice that, mm -hmm. that's there uh, and that's meritorious in this decisive way in one instance, and in the other instance, you, you, you lack that choice. So there does have to be uh, a difference. But what I want to get away from, what I would urge is, is something we should get away from in our thinking is, is that there is this, this influx from God, and then there's my choice. And my choice, it's almost like the bumper cars, that my choice follows from that. And it's either, and, and then as soon as you grant that view, which is an extremely intuitive view, it's almost impossible to avoid thinking of it this way. But, but when you do, then you're committed either to the Dominican or the Jesuit track. There are other ways to think about it too, but those are the two basic types of view. Either you're going to say um, that, that there's a certain kind of a, a push, if you will. I know I'm, I'm giving a gross characterization of their view, but there's a kind of causal influx that determines what I do. And it's, it's either efficacious or it isn't. And, and if it isn't, there's no way I'm doing what I need to do. I just, unless I have that, I can't really actually do what I need to do or the other view which tries to save more of my moral responsibility or autonomy in this uh, is that God gives you this kind of indeterminate causal influx which you then channel in the right way or in the wrong way but then that really puts the initiative on your side and then there come the charges of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism which I think you know go, th go through so um I don't know if that, I hope that helps to bring a little bit of clarity. So I would say that there's a difference between efficacious and sufficient grace. But when we 
when we talk about grace, we're talking about God's action, we're talking about God. And, and like any time we do this, we're talking about God from the effects. This is relational predication. It's not that we're inside God and then we can talk from God's way forward to our way. It's rather we're looking up from the, from the effects. And when we have the effect of someone's saved or someone's not saved, then we have to, you know, th- those facts condition um, how we denominate God's activity. You know, before I give Eric a, a chance to jump in here, I wanted to ask a couple follow-up questions to that. You mentioned antecedent and consequent will. And the way I've heard it uh, put, and tell me if this is fair, is that it's like a judge who, you know, has his son and his son has committed murder. And in one sense, the judge wants to let his son go. But in another sense, he knows that he needs to be just and he doesn't want to let him go and he wants to punish him. So would that be a fair uh, distinction between antecedent and consequent will? Yeah, I do think it illustrates that Thomas uses a similar example himself of a, just, uh, of a judge who's imposing a capital sentence on somebody uh, that's committed a crime. And I think that, again, bearing in mind the, the need not to, to project you know, all, of, all of the way that things are for us and our interactions onto God, that it does get the essential point across, the idea being that um, when God allows, and it's an, there's different kinds of willing, I think this is really important too, that um, you know, God's intending is not the same thing as God's putting up with. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we talk about the divine permission of evil, and that's helpful, but also a little misleading. It's When we say God permits evil, it's not that he permits it like he's, he allows you to ambivalently do evil just like he wants you to do good. Um, it's more that he accepts it or he puts mm-hmm. up with it. And that's a kind of willing, but it's a very different kind of willing than intending or choosing. Um, it's kind of like the kind of willing that we do when we take uh, you know, medicine for high blood pressure and we accept the fact that we're putting ourselves at risk for hemorrhage or stroke or something mm-hmm. like that. It's accepting okay. a side effect. So I think that's right. Um, this idea of antecedent and consequent will is that in light of the demerits that God foresees, in light of the sins that we commit, um, God allows us, right? God allows uh, the punishment that is due to those sins to, to occur. But he wants us to be saved, and he gives us everything that we need in order to be saved so that when it comes to why didn't I then mm. do what I needed to do, there's no answer other than me. You can't mm. point to something in God that's different. And this is key. We could maybe return to this if you want to. But mm-hmm. um, the idea here, it's very important, is that because of divine simplicity, because of the idea that God is pure act, differences in created effects, differences in the world can't be mapped back onto God. There are not differences in God corresponding to differences in the created order. Um, if I choose X versus not X, that doesn't correspond to a will in God that had to be different, that, 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 that implies that somehow God is intrinsically different in a world where I do one thing versus a world I do other. God is the same across, if you will, possible worlds. God is the same in all these different possible scenarios. He's, he doesn't change when he creates. Um, he's pure act. And in fact, if he weren't pure act, he couldn't create at all. So the reasons that we have for thinking that there's a God in the first place and the reasons that we have for thinking that he must be the cause of this created effect are the very reasons that also lead us to conclude that, uh, at least in some cases, uh, there are created effects that are truly contingent that don't have sufficient reasons other than their very own obtaining, right? So Mm -hmm. if a sinner remains in his sin, uh, you can't trace that back to something that would have had to have been different in the world for his choice to have been determined differently, or even a difference in God that would have correlated to a difference in the sinner's will. Um, the only first cause, if you will, of that privation just is the sinner who's capable of defecting because of his freedom. Um, okay. And, and one, one more follow-up question. Um, you spoke about grace, and could you clarify for me, is grace something created? Because I, I, I hear language about created grace, but then I hear that, well, it's not actually a created substance. Um, can you maybe just real quick clarify if grace is created? I'll, I'll try to. That's, that's, that's a big question. <laughs> real quick. Not, not something we could address really quickly. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, but, but let me try to take a little stab at it. Um, I, I think it's easier if we, if we can limit uh, the sense in which we're dealing with grace to talk about the question we're handling right now, mm. um, considering right now. So there is a question about uh, the, the ontological status of grace that, that's particularly relevant to 
sanctifying or habitual, I'd prefer to say habitual grace because actual graces can be holy making as well, mm. sanctifying as well. Um, so that, that debate centers more on the nature of, of, of habitual grace. Is habitual grace a created habit in the soul, which is Aquinas's view, or is it something uncreated? Other authors, some Eastern authors have suggested that it's uncreated. And, and there, are, there are some difficulties trying to really give a fully satisfactory account either way with that. It's an issue that I've been intrigued by, but I haven't drilled mm-hmm. down on as much as sure. I would like to, to feel fully satisfied oh, myself. Yeah, yeah. The issue, the issue is that for on Thomas's side, and this is the more established view, that um, if you say that grace isn't created, you risk merging the creature into God. Um, and and that's, obvious, that's a problem for obvious reasons. On the other side, if you say that, uh, that sanctifying grace or habitual grace is something created, which is what, at least in the West, the tradition has, has tended to say, then you're left with the question, well, then how does it really divinize us? How is, how is our mm-hmm. deification more than a metaphor? Um, how does something that is less than divine um, actually make us a participant? How does having that amount to having a participation in the divine nature? So those are thorny questions. Mm-hmm. When it comes to uh, actual grace, when it comes to auxilium, divine assistance, which is the term that we hear in liturgy sometimes, uh, the divine assistance, here, I think we are talking about uh, a created reality. Um, mm. We're talking about the actions that God performs in operating in and through me, mm. or maybe to be more precise, we're talking more narrowly about my action as it depends on God, or it, it's, we're talking about the dependence relation that my action bears to God as the source of its existence. Okay. All right. So I want to give Eric a chance to jump in here. I know I've asked a lot of follow-up questions. So Eric, I, I know you probably have a few that, you know, are, are itching at you. So go ahead and ask them. Yeah. Well, you know, one, one thing I wanted to say, uh, to comment on, uh, in, and, uh, we'll, we'll get Dr. Mataba's, uh, comment on this when he gets his turn to talk, but, uh, Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae, he, he, poses the question uh, that you were asking before, and uh, this is the answer he gives. Uh, he says, yet why does God choose some for glory and reprobates other has no reason except the divine will? Whence Augustine says, quote, why he draws one and another he does not, Seek not to judge if thou dost not wish to err. Hmm. So this is a, a very uh, a pleasant but uncomfortable agnosticism that we see in the Western tradition. And I, I admire it very much because so much in the theological research, uh, it's, it's to fight the agnosticism away, to figure out how we could... Um, how we could actually bring this into the gnosis of a human person, uh, in, into our knowledge, like doc, Dr. Mataba was saying, we have God's being and then our mode of thinking, and we, we constantly want to put those two into a mainstream so that it's one-to-one and that we can understand God like we understand a human or a friend of ours or a family member. And uh, that's one of the reasons why there's so, I think, there's so much confusion on this. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say, or ask rather, is, uh, you know, sufficient grace, efficacious grace, we know that there are good reasons to talk about it in those terms. We also are, you know, somewhat annoyed at their overuse because they could mislead. Um, but in my understanding, uh, the the kind of grace, I'm not sure if, if there are difference in, in the kind, because the, the only difference between somebody who has uh, obtained efficacious grace uh, to the end versus somebody who has a sufficient grace up to a certain point is the finality versus the temporality or or rather the finality versus the uh, only going so much before death. So if somebody is baptized, somebody receives the grace of God, the the habitus of grace, um, 
but they're only they're only walking with the Lord for 10, 15 years, and then they fall away versus uh, somebody else who receives efficacious grace and uh, their Christian life is only five years, but they had a couple of fallbacks. So they actually came out of sanctifying grace and came back into sanctifying grace um, just before death, and they end up being saved. So maybe the difference between these two things is not so much the kind uh, as much as it is that one is given to infallibly endure at least till death. Um, because, you know, some of the elect may have fallen away before their death, and then they have a deathbed conversion, let's say, and uh, they re-enter into the channel of charity and uh, are saved in the end, whereas other people can be walking in grace all the way up into death and then fail to persevere because maybe the trial of death is too much, you know, and then they end up dying in their sins. So, um, and this is a question that comes up a lot even in, in, a, in the dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox, at least on my end, because uh, it seems as though many th uh, scholars in the Catholic world today have kind of walked away from St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, full view on predestination. At least it seems to me that's the case, because the, the, the more modern I read uh, of the literature on this question, it seems that um, it, it, it's, they're just trying to keep this thing consistent where there's free will, God responds to our free will, and that's the bottom line. Um, but the Eastern Orthodox, for example, uh, in one of their councils in uh, the 17th century, uh, 1672, it was a council of, held in Jerusalem where they drew up a confession. And uh, of those decrees in the confession, they talked about predestination because they were responding to the Protestant beliefs that were being published and translated from Germany and particularly associated with a man named Dositheus. But uh, in that decree on predestination, it basically says that God bestows this grace of available salvation to every human being. So God has the initiative always, but he's looking to see who's going to pick that grace up and run with it all the way to the end. And that logically precedes the determined predestination population. Uh, so, the, you know, God is responding to man. Uh, and, uh, you know, they condemned any other view. So th this, was, this is one of the reasons why I myself, this will be a topic for another day we could talk more about, because I know the listeners would be very interested in this. One of the major reasons I could never be an Eastern Orthodox Christian is because of this. In fact, I would say it's more because of this than the papacy. Um, because uh, it's such a clear teaching in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, that there is this mysterious will of God to choose some to infallible salvation, you know, to move their will infallibly so that it, they reach the goal of eternal life eternal glory. And then, uh, like Dr. Matava was explaining so wonderfully, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard somebody explain it so well, uh, that the, the others, he gives enough for them to, 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 to get to be saved. They, he, he gives them sufficient amount to be saved, each and every individual. Um, but he doesn't give them this super abundant, infallible grace that leads them to the end without failure. And I, I'm wondering if Dr. Matava is following with me here, and if he knows the difference what, of what I'm saying, because a lot of our Eastern Orthodox uh, in the dialogue with Catholics would definitely have an issue with this about why is, that, why is it that there's still a difference between some who are going to be saved infallibly 
the word. Um, it's not necessary that they're saved, but it's certain that they're saved. Um, and then there are others who are kind of left to be deprived of that super abundant, infallible uh, application of grace. Uh, that's still a question, you know, uh, that, uh, and I, I would be curious if you think that this is ju just like Augustine and Aquinas said, um, we just can't really know. And, and that's kind of where I'm at with that, because uh, I think that as we try to scratch and dig away at an answer to that question, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make God's infinitude, immutability, and infinite majesty into the finite that we can scrutinize. Uh, would you see it that way, uh, Dr. McAuvin? Yeah, thanks for bringing up the passage that you read uh, from the Summa. I think that's spot on. And I would agree with, with Augustine, with Thomas there, and with St. Paul uh, yeah. about the ins inscrutability of the divine will. I think we've got to, you know, th th that's one of the principles that has to define the parameters of our reflections on this issue. So I'm totally with you there. Um, I don't know as much about the developments in Orthodox theology on this. I think you know more about that than I do. So I appreciate knowing about this and I can't comment uh, too much on that. But on the basis of what you said, a couple of, of thoughts occur to me. Um, one, and this is another parameter defining point, is that uh, when we look at the New Testament, we've got, and, and look at the canon of scripture as a whole, we've got a kind of tension, uh, if you will, or, or, or a witness that, 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 that speaks to both the inscrutable will of God to save some and, and, the, and the infallibility of that plan, that there is such a thing as predestination, which is news to a lot of Catholics. So we've, we've tended to avoid this issue, but we, it would probably be better for us to address it straight on and teach truthfully and clearly about it and clarify that this is not double predestination. Um, this is a New Testament fine teaching. But, um, but we have that in balance, again, with evidence of God's universal salvific will uh, in tension with uh, affirmations of human free choice and self-determination. I mean, the very concept of free choice is a biblical Jewish concept. And that, I think, deserves to be much more widely appreciated than it, than it has been. It's not a Greek philosophical concept. Uh, Aristotle begins to hit around the idea. He's got a notion of the voluntary, but he doesn't have, it would seem, any explicit recognition of free choice as such. Where you get free choice in the Western, the, the tradition of Western thought is from the Jews, uh, from, from, from the Old Testament. And it's very hard to make sense, uh, apart from specific instances like Deuteronomy 30, Sirach 15, um, it's very hard to make sense of the biblical narrative as a whole, this back and forth between God and the people and covenant theology without a concept of, of, of real free choice. So um, what we're faced with is, is, is a witness, a balanced witness, or maybe a witness that embodies attention that we've got to take as a whole. And the temptation is always to deal with this tension by resolving it in favor of one of the two poles, by privileging some texts over others. In this case, the mystery that we're dealing with is very much an instance of a, of a core classical mystery of Christian theology, just like the Trinity or the Incarnation. And just like in the heresies that cropped up in the fourth, fifth centuries, um, the tendency here too is always going to be to privilege one side of this mystery at the detriment of the other. Um, now, one thing that's different about the Orthodox tradition is that they, and, and this is, I'll speak more on the basis of the Eastern Fathers more than what happened later, but um, in the East, they never had to deal with Pelagius or with Pelagianism. And so it tends to be the case that they come off sounding a little more Pelagian or to put it maybe in a friendlier way, they end up being much more sanguine about free choice and, and more confident in their affirmations about uh, the capacity of free choice. And so even the, you know, the Jesuits will call on certain fathers, Greek fathers especially, to back up their position. Um, and that's not a fault of the Eastern fathers or the later people, but it's to just come to terms with the reality that historically uh, Pelagianism was a problem that really affected Latin theology. And for Augustine's engagement with Pelagius just defined the state of play to the present day. And um, that's the framework that we're thinking and working within. And that, that's fine too. I think it would be an error to say, 
well, um, the church's affirmations about the divine initiative and God's sovereignty are historically relative, and we have to transcend the in light of the fact that we're not dealing with, I mean, Pelagianism is a real problem, and it got a real answer from Augustine and from the Council of Second Orange in 529 and things like this, Trent even. And, uh, you know, our faith is an historical faith. It's an historical reality. So when these challenges come up, those challenges might be limited to a particular time and place, but we should be careful about saying that, therefore, the church's response to those very particular concrete events is just, you know, for yesterday and not for today. Um, so they didn't have to deal with, with uh, Pelagianism. I think that might be what's, what's coming through and some of what you've encountered there. Um, one of the things that, that I would say to, to offer maybe a clarification, we were talking about efficacious grace and how it differs from sufficient grace. And a distinction that I didn't bring out, but I think I should bring out, is between perseverance and efficacious grace. And some of our conversation has tended to, and my own in, input into it, has tended to characterize efficacious grace as perseverance. And I think what I'd like to do is backtrack a little bit and say that when we're talking about sufficient and efficacious grace, we're talking about a grace given for the performance of some good action. And, uh, it, and perseverance has to do with the sequence of those graces that carries you through to the end so that if you persevere in, in God's grace and you continue to live out the life of good deeds that he's set before him, then you'll attain heavenly glory. But the question of efficacious grace is more narrow than if you have efficacious grace, you're going to heaven. As you suggested, Eric, you know, somebody could have efficacious grace and not make it to heaven because here they had the efficacious grace to do what God called them to do, the meritorious good act. But then, of course, in the next moment, um, they can resist that grace or they, could, they, can, they can choose to sin. So I would, I would distinguish the question about perseverance from the question about grace's efficacy. Uh, perseverance has to do with that sequence over time. Um, but I'm with you, uh, to go back to the beginning, I'm with you on this perspective on divine incomprehensibility and the inscrutability of God's will. Um, I think predestination and hell, like we talked about earlier, are issues that we tend to see avoided uh, or you know, in, in preaching in theology today, and, and they, they deserve probably more straightforward treatment. They're very thorny issues. And one of the difficulties is, unlike mysteries that are equally difficult to think about, like the Trinity or Incarnation, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're, when we're thinking about grace, we don't have the same guardrails or guideposts along the road that we have uh, with those other mysteries. So this is more difficult territory to navigate. Yeah, I, I um, you know, you, you know much more about the, uh, the auxilies controversy, but it, it's very close to my heart. And, um, you know, we have a lot of theologians out there that are still waiting for an answer on the dubia uh, of uh, Amoris Laetitia. I, I'm still waiting for the resolution to uh, De Auxilis. <laughs> well, I, uh, I am too. You know, I was going to have a party on the 400th anniversary. But, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that time came and went. That was when I was writing my dissertation. I thought we should do something to mark the 400. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Pope, Pope Benedict didn't want to do anything about it at the time. Right. So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me get some clarification and then I, I kind of want to, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll shift gears into a different question. Um, just to kind of summarize your last point, you're essentially saying distinguishing between efficacious grace and persevering grace. You're saying that persevering grace that grace that enables a person to uh, persevere to the end um, is something that is rooted in God's will. It's not based upon uh, foreknowledge of any of their merit or any of, or consent or something like that. Um, it's rooted in God's will, but ultimately we cannot know why God wills some and not others. Is that correct? That's right. I'd say a, two things about that. One, uh, <coughs> we can't know all of God reason, God's reasons for choosing this rather than that. We can, that doesn't mean we can't know anything. Um, we can know why God chooses what he chooses. Uh, he chooses what he chooses for the sake of the goods that he brings about. Um, so it's not that this is a, a complete, a completely cloaked and, and leaves, mm -hmm. leaves us hanging. I mean, 
we can see why God does the good things that he does. It's for the sake of the goods that he brings about. But the, the thorny question has to do with why he chooses this specific thing rather than this alternative. And that is inscrutable, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. though I think that the inscrutability of it, vexing as it might be, um, is something that, that it becomes more tolerable when we think, one, about just the nature of God and our relationship to him and, and what we could expect to know. Uh, about God and what we could expect to say about him. But also, secondly, um, looking at just the, by way of analogy, human choosing. There's a certain mystery to, to human choices as well. And when we're dealing with real instances of free choice, not just behaviors or actions that we might loosely call choices, like my kids choosing to knock the milk over or something, but a real deliberate choice, there is a kind of mystery to that even in our case, um, we can always explain the choice we made in terms of the goods that we pursued in, in, in the choice, but why this rather than that is, if, if we're talking about real freedom, is kind of inscrutable. Um, it's, it's just the choosing that, that settles why this rather than that. The point is, I could have gone this way, I could have gone that way, and nothing else settled it, just my choosing. So mm-hmm. there's even a kind of relative mystery to human choosing, which we're much closer to, and so we're up against that um, in God's case, or something analogous to that in mm-hmm. God's case. Um, but with, back to your first point, with uh, perseverance, this, uh, this is something that can't be merited. So just like justification, the grace of justification can't be merited, uh, we can't merit uh, final perseverance. That's something that is totally God's, God's initiative, God's mercy. Okay. Well, um, you know, let me, let me then ask two, two other questions before we dive into the other, other topic. So you, you spoke about analogy here. Um, you know, some would make the accusation, oh, well, you know, if God grants persevering grace to some and not the others, that makes him unloving. But you would be indicating that God's love and God's will, by extension, is not necessarily identifiable uh, univocally with our will in the way that we love. There is, um, there is some similarity, but there also is some difference. There's an analogical uh, relationship between the two. So is that maybe perhaps the response that you would give for those who would make the charge and say that, you know, God, God is unloving because if, you know, I knew my kids were going to hell, I wouldn't create them to begin with. So um, is yeah. that perhaps your response? There's a lot going on there. So that is definitely part of it. Anytime we talk about God, we have to bear in mind the limitations on what we can know about God. And while there are some debates about analogy versus univocity, some, some very interesting vehement debates that are still going on that trace their roots back to the Middle Ages, um, I'm, I'm pretty sold on the idea that we've got to have analogy, um, that, that what we can know about God from creatures demands that uh, we talk about God, think about God in analogous terms, because uh, creatures really bear a relationship to him, so we can know God, we can make literal claims about him. But uh, the very basis we have for, th- for knowing that he's there also leads us to conclude that he's utterly different from any creature. And so the words that we, the concepts and words that we apply to God can't um, be applied in, in exactly the same sense that they apply to creatures. So we're limited when we think about God and speak about him. Sometimes we can have recourse to things like metaphor. Scripture does that when it talks about God as a lion or compares God to a rock. Um, but we can do better than that. Not only uh, do we have metaphors, which are useful in analogies, but uh, those are always figures of speech. And, and I think we can make literal claims about God, but bearing in mind that the words shift in sense in order to accommodate God, who's transcendent, as he must be, in order to be the first cause of the mm. created effects that we know. Mm. So when we talk about God's loving, the, God's love, God's mercy, we've got to bear in mind that Uh, we don't start from an inside knowledge of what God is like or what God's will is like or what God's love is like. Um, We have to start respecting the mystery of God and then go on what we have to go on, namely the created effects that, that through which God reveals himself to us. The other thing though, that might be more um, immediately pertinent is that uh, when, when we come at this by saying, or by thinking, um, God gives the gift of final perseverance to some, but not to others. Well, how could he be a loving father? How could he be merciful if he allows, if, if, he's, if he doesn't give this grace of final perseverance to some? Again, we've got to bear in mind, I think, what perseverance is. And it's this sequence of graces, sequence of efficacious graces that bears us through to the end. Mm. 
well, what, it, what then are efficacious graces? If, if I'm right to think that these graces are God's operation in our operations, God's making our good operations actually to be, and, and, and so what we're naming when we use the term perseverance is the, 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 the chain of, these, of God operating in us through the end such that we operate as we ought then we've got to also bear in mind that always what we're talking about, the effect that we're talking about is, a, is, is our free action. So when we're saying, again, relational predication, relational talk about God, when we're saying God doesn't give somebody the gift of final perseverance, um, well, why didn't he? I mean, or or what, what is it that's going on when he didn't give that perseverance? It isn't that they didn't have what they needed to persevere, uh, or in principle, they mm-hmm. could have, right? They could have made it to the end, um, but there's a defect that they they turn away. So, and Trent talks about this too. It's again, it's the asymmetry point that whereas God has the initiative in salvation, and we can't merit perseverance just like we can't merit justification. Um, he's not the first to desert. He's the first to save, but he's not the first to desert us. When it comes to desertion, it's breaking away from the relationship. We have the initiative in that. So whenever somebody falls or falls out of sanctifying grace or, or refuses the, 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 the actual grace to do the good thing that God wants them to do, um, God takes the initiative in making the action come about. We take the initiative, though, in, in the actions being defective. And so uh, I think that it just, it, it, it's, it's kind of a game of words or a mistake of words and concepts when we say, God gave one person final perseverance. He didn't give the other person final perseverance. Therefore, God can't be a loving father. It ignores the fact of what, what perseverance is and, and what that means about the human agent's relationship to God and, um, and where mm. the defect is coming from. Uh, th- it's yeah. the human agent that's the first cause of the defect. Well, well said. And, and you noted two things there, transcendence and God's operations. And that dovetails into... Um, the next question that I wanted to dive into, and that is, in Thomism, we see that God's essence is simple. Uh, so his essence is identified with his operations, his activities, what he does. But how can it be that God can come into contact with creation and his operations and his activities while still remaining transcendent in his essence um, be- if, if they're the same thing? Th- does this somehow mean that uh, there are some operations or activities of God that are um, not part of his essence? That's a good question. It, it, I think that, and you can tell me if I'm on track here, I think where your question's coming from um, is, is that when we talk about God's presence to the world or presence to his creative effects and his transcendence, these sound like two opposite things, mm-hmm. right? It's, it seems mm-hmm. like it's, it's one thing to be intimate, to be close, to be within, and it's another thing to be totally other and to be outside of and to be removed. And so, um, if God's essence is, if God is simple, such that God is his own act, um, then wouldn't we say God's essence is identical with his operations? And if his essence is identical uh, with his operations, then uh, how does he either come into contact with creatures or how does he remain transcendent? We say both. Um, I think that the, the one thing to bear in mind here is that uh, imminence and transcendence seem to be opposite realities um and they they if if god were both distant and near in the same way we'd have a contradiction but when we claim that he's distant when we claim that he's near he's he's not distant and near in the same way he's distant in one way and he's near in another um how is he distant he's distant by uh the very thing that lets him be near. So I guess that the point is to go back to the grounds we have for rationally thinking that there is a God, right? Uh, Because even before we get to faith and revelation, we first got to have a concept of God, right? So that we know that this is God talking, this is God revealing. And we know the existence of God through the existence of creatures, right? Contingent creatures, which, require a first cause of their existence. And I'm thinking here the third way type of argument that we see in Aquinas. If we follow that reasoning through, um, then, then the reasons that we have for thinking that there is a God uh, are also reasons for concluding that that God is utterly different from anything in our experience, right? That if he has what it takes to be the ultimate source of the being of things, uh, 
things which don't explain their own existence because what they are and that they are, are, are different. And nevertheless, here it is. I'm confronted with it with an instance of a thing of this kind, namely everything that's in our experience is like that. <coughs> we could give a partial account of what makes those things to be in terms of other created causes, but that story never ends. It never grounds out until we can posit a being whose essence is his very being, his very existence. This is the divine simplicity claim, right? That God is his nature, that God's nature is his being. And so that's the kind of being that God has to be in order to be the, the creator, the source of, of the things in our experience. So the very basis we have for knowing he's there is also the basis for knowing that he's utterly transcendent. But if we think through a little bit further what his nature is, right? Think more about what we can conclude from his nature as existence, pure act. Uh, God is the, God's effect is the existence of things, right? God, whose nature is to be, has for his effect the being of things other than himself, right? And so uh, this makes God imminent uh, to creatures, right? He's, he's, he's very present to creatures because anytime, anywhere, any created thing is, it always exists in relationship to him. And this is also what grounds analogy. It's the relationship that created effects bear to God. So how is it that this God is not just so transcendent that we're lost in the fog of agnosticism? This is a possible direction that some theologians go right into the void where, where they say, especially in contemporary Anglophone uh, theology, they'll, they'll say, well, if, if God, the creator is this simple, pure act, then he's so utterly different. We can't know anything about him. All of our words change their, their sense so much that our claims about God become meaningless and we're lost in this void, right? What does is even mean uh, said of the divine? And Thomas has an element of this negativity in his theology, but that negative element is always couched within an affirmative horizon. He starts from the claim that God is and, and he is because he must be the first cause of creatures, then well, what is he like? Well, he must be different in order to, to be what it takes to be the source, the ultimate source of creatures. Okay, well, if he's like that and his proper effect is existence, right? Not just that things are this way or that way, but that things are rather than not at all. Um, if that's the kind of God he is, then he's active, not only when the thing comes about in the beginning, at its inception, but he's active holding that thing in being. And so we have the doctrine of conservation. Thomas characterizes this as a continuous creation. Um, it's as it were, God is continually creating a thing. Um, he's not trying to give us an occasionalistic picture, but uh, what he is saying is that creatures once created by God are not often running like the deist worldview, right? The watchmaker God where he makes a world and then it's completely autonomous from him running on its own principles. There is such a thing as nature. There, there are created principles of action, but no creature can exist except in relationship to God. And then he takes it a step further and says that God is even active in the operations of creatures. This is what we've been talking about uh, this evening, that uh, the God who makes creatures to be and holds them in being also moves them to act. So um, this is how he's intimate. He's intimate as the agent is to his effect. He's within the claim that God is uh, within things, that God is everywhere and omnipresent isn't the kind of pantheistic claim that, uh, that beings are bits of God. Um, rather, it's that they have their own being, which is distinct, right? The trees in my yard have their own tree essay, and I have my own human essay. God has his transcendent divine essay. But these finite existence, the finite acts of existence, finite entities, uh, only have this being in connection to God. So, the very thing that makes him able to be the source of things is also, and, and makes him able to be the source of things, makes him utterly different from the things that he makes. But that difference also grounds the basis we have for thinking he's utterly intimate, more intimate to things than they are to themselves. Um, so when it comes to identifying God, you asked about his operations. If God is simple in his essence, if he's identical with his operations, I think, um, one is to, to recognize some of the implications of divine simplicity there, but, but another is to distinguish what we mean by God's operations. And there's a sense in which God is not identical with his operations, if you, if you bear me out. Um, 
I think that when we use the term operations, sometimes we're, we're naming uh, not God's imminent actions of knowing and loving, right, or the Father's begetting of the Son. Um, what, we're, what we're talking about are God's causal actions, um, his bringing about a creature, his moving a creature to act, his causing this person to be saved, for example. And so if by operation we're referring to God's causal actions, well, then we might not be naming the divine essence. Um, Thomas has a good way into this uh, in the Prima Pars when he takes up creation in question 45. He, he asks, what is creation? And he gives us a twofold answer. He says, we can look at creation or here, God's operation, God's causal action. You can look at it in two ways. Uh, if you look at it from the side of the agent, it's nothing other than the divine essence. And so in that sense, God's operation is just God. Um, but on the other side, um, we can look at God's operation as something itself created, in which case it's the relationship that the creature bears to God. And here Thomas talks about these relations as inherent in the creatures. Um, so what we've got there is an idea of divine action or divine operation as something in the world, something in the creature uh, that is not the divine essence, but it's something that connects the creature to God, to God's essence. Okay. And, and that also leads me then to another question. Um, if God's will is identified with his essence, how can he uh, choose to create freely? Because it seems that his will would be identified with his essence, and that would mean that it's his will to create is necessary. What, why would it be the case that creation is not necessary? Yeah, right. So if God chooses to create a world and God is unchanging, doesn't it mean that the world can't not be? Um, or that, that God can't but create. And then what we're back to is a kind of platonic view or something like it where creation is maybe a necessary emanation of things from the one or a necessary emanation of things from, from the divine. And that's, that's definitely not a biblical view of God or creation, but it's also not uh, the metaphysical view uh, that you see in St. Thomas. So a, a couple of points I'd, I'd offer there. Um, one is that... Um, God does will something of necessity, right? So there is, a, there is a certain respect in which the divine will is necessitated, um, but that is in willing his own goodness. Um, why think that creatures are not necessary? Well, from the very same third way type of argument that I, that I suggested earlier, um, when we reflect on creatures um, and the being of creatures, we realize that what a creature is, is not the same as that it is, or what a creature is, the cre cre creature's nature or essence, doesn't include within it um, the creature's being actual, the creature's being, this is the real distinction of being in essence. So recognizing that is to recognize the contingency of creatures. And if we, as soon as we recognize the contingency of creatures right there, we've got the idea that the world doesn't have to be. So the, the, the distinction between what a creature is and that it is, what a thing is and that it is, gives us a, a view of the world which is not a necessary emanation from any source. Um, there is an interesting question about whether the world could be eternal. Thomas entertains, at least philosophically, that maybe it could be. He doesn't think it's the most probable opinion. He thinks it's revealed to have been created in time. But even, and this is sort of a litmus test case, uh, even if you grant philosophically an eternal world, what you can't have is an uncreated world. So maybe you've got an eternal world, but it's for Thomas always going to be a world that's independence upon a first cause. So the real distinction of what a thing is and that it is, um, I think breaks you free from the idea that the world must be and, and can't be otherwise. Um, then uh, we've also got this idea that God wills his own goodness. There's nothing else to will. If there's no world, the world doesn't have to be. Um, so God is not necessitated in willing uh, creatures, though he is necessitated in willing the goodness that he is. Uh, creatures reflect and manifest that goodness, and so they're willed, as it were, along the way to uh, God willing his own goodness. And hypothetically, or on the condition that God wills something, then it has a kind of necessity to it. So you could say that there's a necessity to God's creating the world if all you mean by that is given that God has willed to create, creation is necessary. But that's on the hypothesis that God has willed to create, which is not something he's necessitated to doing. Um, 
here I think it's, it's important to, to, to think about how divine transcendence affects how we think about the relationship between causes and effects. We're used to thinking about, uh, in, in the physical world, every cause is, uh, is a caused cause in a sense, right? There's no, <coughs> there's no action without an equal and opposite reaction and things like that. But in God's case, uh, we have an example of, um, of, of an action where creatures become really related to God, but God is not really related to creatures. In other words, um, creating doesn't involve God undergoing a change. It's true that before, if you will, uh, before there's a creation, God is not the creator, or if there wasn't the creation, God wouldn't be the creator. He'd still be God, but he wouldn't be the creator. It sounds like there's a change. But that's, that's really a nominal uh, difference. Um, God's being the creator or not is a claim about things being related to God, not a claim about who God is in say. Um, Thomas compares this to the example of a column being to the left of the man and then the man moving on being on his right. The column hasn't undergone any real change, even though different things become sayable, tr become true or false about the column. Um, this is like the way it is between God and creatures. The relationship is a mixed one. Uh, the creatures are really dependent upon God. As I suggested earlier, God's action or God's operations uh, understood in this passive sense are something in the creature. They're, it's in the created order. It's the relationship the creature has to God. But God doesn't acquire something by becoming the creator. God doesn't have a new relationship in him. The only relations in God are the Father, Son, and Spirit, the subsistent relations, which are the divine persons. So there, the, all of the change, if you will, when we're talking about creation is on the side of what comes into being. It's not that God undergoes an intrinsic change. It's God is, again, God is the same across all possible worlds. And this connects back to our earlier question about free choice. Um, what does it mean for God to cause a choice and the choice still to remain free? Well, God wills this or, you know, this person to do this or this person to do that, they're really free in doing it, meaning that their determination is settled just by them. You can't point to anything in the created order that, that corresponds to their choice that's antecedent to it and makes it to be this way instead of that. And you can't point back to God's will and say, well, God willed them to do this, therefore he did. And if had God willed something different, he would have done that. As if it were the case that you've got God A and God B. And that if, if the person did one thing, God would be one way. And if the person did another thing, God would be the other way. You can't map differences in the created order back onto supposed differences in God. Because if God were an entity like that, he wouldn't be the kind of entity that you've got to have to explain the existence of contingent creatures. Mm -hmm. So it all starts from the recognition that there's a real distinction of being in essence. If that is a sensible distinction to make, then it leads to implications about God and God's nature that get you a picture of a transcendent God who has causal actions that correspond to differences in the world, but which don't entail real changes in him because he's pure act and he, mm. he can't undergo change. Which if I understand correctly, I want to say uh, that was Thomas's first book on being in essence. So when he took up the pen, that was the first thing that he addressed was uh, this distinction that you say is pretty pivotal for all these other issues. That's um, right. Yeah. You know, one other question that I want to give uh, Eric a chance to, you know, ask any other final questions. Um, one thing that has really confused me in the past is how can there be distinctions in the Trinity uh, by divine relations, i.e. that, you know, one, one is ungenerate, one is generate, one spirates. Um, so there's differences between their relations, the, the, between the three persons of the Trinity, but these distinctions or differences do not somehow result in, uh, composition, you know, violating God's simplicity. How, how is it the case that, uh, distinction does not cause division? Yeah, that's, that's, you're drilling down on the big ones tonight here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so now um, we're talking about relations that are in God. Um, you know, a minute ago when we were talking about God, um, God's relationship to the world, we were saying that, that creatures bear a relationship to the creator, but God doesn't acquire some new metaphysical status by being the, the creator that wasn't there before. But when we're talking about the persons of the Godhead, um, Thomas, going back to Augustine, going back to the Eastern Fathers, the Cappadocian Fathers, 
identifies the persons of the Godheads as relations. The only basis we have for making any distinctions in God who is one and who is simple. And this is the, the God of the Old Testament, right? Hero is for the Lord is one. Uh, what God revealed right through the Old Testament was his, his transcendence and his unity uh, to a world clouded in sin that, that tended toward uh, polytheism, uh, right? So God first gets across that he's one and that he's living and transcendent. And now in the, in the period of the New Testament, he's, he's got to communicate uh, this, that, that this one God is a communio, is a communio of, of love. Um, well, it can't be that there are three gods, um, it can't be that there's any division in the Godhead or any composition. God doesn't have parts. It's not that the, the claim of the Trinity is not that the Father, Son, and Spirit are each pieces of God, and all together they make up the totality, which is the divine nature. So the claim of simplicity is that there's no composition. God has no parts. That's still true. So the Trinitarian claim can't be that, that the persons are parts. Um, we also say God is one, and, and one doesn't mean one is the principle of number, but it's a negative attribute. There's no division in the Godhead. So we've got to harmonize the plurality, or not harmonize, but give an account of, do justice to the fact that the Son is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son, that these are really distinct individuals, but they're not pieces of God, and they're not divided against each other, even though they are distinct. So I think the first thing is to, is to clarify what the Trinitarian mystery is claiming, clarify what the alternative options are, and then that will maybe put us in, in a position to, to be able to get at um, how uh, the, the persons are all consubstantially God, how they're all equally divine, but that nevertheless they're not each other, and this doesn't amount to a claim that undercuts divine simplicity or divine unity. So uh, the, the Trinitarian claim in a nutshell, again, is that uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. They're all co-equally divine, fully divine. So not just partially divine or have one aspect of the Godhead. Each of, each of the persons is, is fully divine. Um, also, though, they're not one another. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, and the same for the Holy Spirit. They're all really distinct from each other. Uh, we can get a little clearer on those claims by way of contrast. We look at the early heresies, and like with, with, with other instances of, uh, of great mysteries of the faith, you tend to have one pole or the other. And in this case, the poles tend to be either a pole that privileges the divine unity, which is the monarchian tendency manifest in people like Sibelius or maybe Paul of Samosata, who was an adoptionist, um, who emphasize the divine unity, but downplay the real distinction of the persons of the Godhead, or the other way to run is towards some form of subordinationism, and that's what Arianism is. Arianism is an extreme kind of subordinationism, where in order to affirm the distinction of persons, uh, you're actually saying, well, one is really God, the other is only God in a removed kind of sense, he's a secondary God, and then, and so on. You have a kind of Platonic emanation scheme, if you will, that you're projecting onto God, and, and you're distinguishing the persons by their place on the hierarchy. But that, of course, doesn't allow you to say that, that they're all equally divine. So you have that on the one, one extreme. On the other extreme, you have this tendency to reduce the individu individuals in the Godhead to just roles or different names, but not really different distinct entities. Uh, so the Council of Nicaea, First Council of Constantinople, the New Testament, runs against this uh, by making that twofold claim that the persons are not each other, and yet they are all co-equally God. How it is that this doesn't introduce composition into God is through that claim of Nicaea, that they're all homoousios. Um, so I think to answer your question, what we've really got to get clear at is um, how three, three distinctive persons uh, who are not one another could still be really identical with the same divine nature. Um, how could two, th just reduce it to the Father and the Son, how could two things which are identical with some third thing not be identical with each other? It seems to stand to reason. If the Father is God and the Son is God, then the Father must be the Son. But if we say that, we end up in the heresy of the Patropassians, uh, who had this bizarre idea that it was the Father who suffered and died on the cross, right? Because the Son is just another name for the Father. Um, okay, so the Father and the Son are both God, but they're not each other. And to, to clarify how that could be true, 
uh, Thomas gives us some help going back to Aristotle, and, and he, he points out how two things, are ident two things identical with a third thing are identical with each other when their identity with that third thing is both a real and a conceptual identity. Um, in other words, a simple way to put it would be if the father is, is coterminous, is synonymous with God and son is synonymous with God, then father and son don't have any real distinction between each other. But if there's a real identity between the two items and some third item, and the identity is real, but it's not also conceptual, such that the, the names for the two things could be synonymous, then that, that merely conceptual distinction of the two, between the, each of the two things and the third thing they have in common with each other opens up the space for the two things to be really different from each other. I'm sorry to say this because it's much easier to see on in print and <laughs> to puzzle over than it, is to, than it is to listen to somebody articulate. So we can, if you have questions, come back to me. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, the, that's, that's what he says. And he invokes the example of, of motion, uh, of action and passion, both being ways to name motion or change. And action is not the same thing as passion. Passion is not the same thing as action but they both denominate motion, but they denominate motion in a way that adds an extra conceptual twist. So action is not synonymous with passion, even though the reality signified by action can only be change. The reality signified by passion can only be change, but it's signifying change under a certain twist, under a certain aspect. And so we could say something similar about the persons of the Godhead, these subsistent relations that paternity or fatherhood or father um, set of God is just the divine essence, but it names the divine essence with a certain twist as being the unoriginate source, right? Um, sonship or filiation or God, the son names the divine essence, but with this twist that it's from the father. So there's a conceptual difference between son and divinity. There's a conceptual difference between father and divinity, divine nature. And there's a real identity. The difference between father and divinity is merely conceptual. And same thing for the son. But that merely conceptual distinction between fatherhood and divinity opens up the space for there to be a more than conceptual, but a real distinction between the father and the son. And that's how we have a, a non-monarchian, non-modalist, Sabellian view of the Godhead where son and spirit are not just different names for the father. They're really distinctive individuals in the Godhead that as individuals can be in a communion. You, you can't have communion if they're just different names for the same entity. All you have is this monad and it's utterly kind of unrelational. Mm -hmm. But if you have, and this is what's at stake, it's not just a semantic game. If, if you lose the, the metaphysical individuality of the persons, you've just undercut any possibility of talking about how God is communio, how God is mm -hmm. a loving communio. Mm -hmm. You've got to have distinction in order to have union. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you just have a monad. <clears throat> so this, this distinction, conceptual distinction of father from the divine essence, son from the divine essence, opens up the space for giving the account or understanding how the father could not be the son, the son could not be the father, despite the fact that they're both fully, co-equally, entirely God, not just partially. Um, does that shed a little bit of light? It, it does. And did I hear you say that God is not a, a numerical unity? And if, uh, if he is not, can you maybe define um, that, that distinction? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so when Thomas claims that God is one, when the tradition claims that God is one, uh, we have to understand that term. And there's two ways we could, we could look at the term. Um, one is to, to take it negatively as a negative predicate, where the claim that God is one is, is like the claim God is eternal or God is immutable. Um, it's more of a negation than an affirmation. To say that God is eternal is to say he's not in time. To say that he's immutable is to say that he doesn't change. So to say that God is one is to say that he's not divided. So in that sense, um, one could be taken in a univocal sense, right? The term divided could be taken in a univocal sense. Anytime we're denying things of God, univocity is no problem. Analogy comes into play when we start making affirmations about God, mm -hmm. positive statements. Mm -hmm. So when we're saying what God isn't, then we're using that term that he isn't the same way we use it of creatures, because whatever any creature is, God is not that. Mm -hmm. So taken in one respect, divine unity can just be the denial of division, 
which isn't quite the same thing as one, the principle of number, like one plus one equals two. It's just absence of division. And so in this way, um, to say that God is one, it just says undivided. So you can have a multiplicity of persons um, and still have divine unity, uh, even though there's three persons. In, the, in another sense, uh, taken in a positive way to say that God is one, we really do mean that there's one God. Um, there, there is one living creator God. Um, but now, if we take that in a positive sense, like any other positive term applied to God, we have to remember analogy is in play. These are cited because what could be more basic than the concept of one or, or unity? It seems very straightforward. And, and, and the, the, the clarity and the, the, the frequency that we use, the, the concept of unity in our everyday experience and, and talk can lead us to, to miss the fact that once God is the referent of unity, now unity shifts in sense. And then don't really comprehend, comprehend what its sense is, what the full meaning of unity is said of God or any other positive predicate said of God because of divine simplicity, God is transcendent. So we know that God's unity means he's not divided. We know for independent reasons that there's a plurality of persons in the Godhead, and that those things hang together. Um, we know that there's one God, um, but we don't fully comprehend entirely what that claim positively means any more than we comprehend what, it, what any other positive claim of God means. Okay. And Eric, I'm sorry to hog Dr. Matava and <laughs> ask all no, these uh, questions. Let me give you a chance to jump in here. Yeah, no, it's just uh, amazing listening to this because it, it just confirms my, uh, just looking at this from my, my own set of lens here, which is so much focused on the East-West debate. Um, you know, the, this issue of predestination and the uh, the 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 distinction, the relational distinctions in God, uh, the way that Latin theology has developed, and the way that Greek theology developed, um, you could see the same sort of tension between the two theologies. Uh, it reverberates with different topics, all orbiting around this one central idea of divine simplicity. And um, it's so important, I think, I agree with Dr. Matava, we have to have analogy uh, because it's the only thing that saves the Trinity, in my, understand, in, in my opinion. Uh, without analogy, then we do, our, we, do we, we are off to, back into the heresies of old. And uh, I, I'm happy that there is a... Uh, a a blessed inconsistency in some of the theologies of our uh, separated Christian brethren, because I think analogy is so important. Just like for this one question on the distinction of the persons in the Godhead, um, Saint Thomas Aquinas, like Doctor Matava was saying, uh, looks at motion and how motion is kind of like one thing and uh, the divine essence is one thing. But uh, if you take action and passing or passion or something that's passable, okay, uh, you can have two things that are not equal. Action and passing, say like a ball that's being thrown from father to son, uh, the motion of that ball is one thing, but you could look at it from the fact that it comes from the Father, which is an action, and then you could look at the same exact motion from, this, from, this, from the point of view of the ball itself, which is getting past. So here you have two different things, acting and passing. Hey, son, pass me the ball. Uh, the Father acts, the ball passes, one single motion, one single essence, but two different things. Um, that has to be an analogy, though, because uh, the the Ariuses of the world, the Sabellians of the world, can turn around and say, "Oh, that father is in time." In the 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 ball, the motion that's being thrown 
is an act that's caused. So uh, we have to be careful because the, the, what, that's the, the, the univicism that we see that's so, it, it, it's almost instinctive in, in people's minds today. We have to realize that we're using, we, have, we rely on analogy so much for the survival of Christian doctrine it's just, you know, it only needs to be declared by the magisterium, in my opinion. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the freedom of God and the equality of his uh, will, nature, and operations, uh, again, coming from, coming from the studies on the East to West debate, the, uh, this, this also goes back to analogy. There's a book out there by Dr. Matthew Levering. If you guys know, I'm sure you know already. Uh, it's on creation. I can't, the, the title escapes me, but the first chapter he deals with uh, a theologian of the East who's uh, long passed away, Vladimir Losky, and uh, Losky's critique of divine simplicity and basically the whole Latin system uh, on, on um, on the issue of divine simplicity, particularly the, the divine ideas, because this is where the, the debate comes, not just with the Orthodox, but even, with, even within Catholicism, we see this happening, and definitely with Protestants in the more uh, processed theology side, we see this ramping up more and more in, uh, in, the, in Protestant worlds today, um, is that God necessarily wills his own goodness, like Dr. Motava was saying, uh, and it, that, that was a wonderful explanation. But in, in, in that process of, the, of willing his own goodness by necessity, there is included all these other voluntary acts that we say are unnecessary, like human actions, um, that a rock is here or not here. And so the objectors to divine simplicity are going to say, well, wait a minute. You have this singular willing of God's goodness, which is necessary. But inside of that package is all of these things that you claim are free or are unnecessary. How can that be? Because they're, they collapse, right? The, the, the idea is they just collapse. So a sinful world has to be collapsed into the necessity of God's being. That the devil sinned collapses into the necessity of God's being. Um, and then we have, it's just a, it's, it's just a short circuit in, in, in our, you know, it, with, with this uh, argument, it seems as though Latin theology comes crumbling down like a house of cards. Um, and I think it's so important to make the distinction uh, that, what the, the effects that come out of God, there are those which are necessary, but insofar as it terminates into creation, that's included into the will of God by his ver the variety of willing that he has that we spoke about with St. John Damascene, permissive will, and uh, it, you know his, uh, his will of decree and... Uh, Help me out here. Antecedent the consequent will. will. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's important to keep that in mind because even in the single act of God willing himself, there's included into that the all of the free actions of the agencies that are created. And so each creature is free to be what it is. And that's incorporated into God's foreknowledge, which is, again, equal to his divine being. And uh, that, we can only understand that by analogy. If, if we try to make it univocal, yes, Latin theology would be up the creek, and it would have been many years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, one book uh, that, I, that uh, I, I've read in the, you know, well, it, it, there's, there's several books out there. Just go to St. You know, Thomas Aquinas is probably your best bet. But uh, what I would say if we, to close this is maybe Dr. Mataba has uh, some books that he'd recommend the viewers uh, so that they can peer more into this issue because it, it, it is a pertinent issue. It's, we don't really feel it in the Catholic world uh, as much as 
uh, you know, in, in terms of process theology, like the open theists, um, that's way off on the other spectrum. But it's a big debate brewing right now. If you read like uh, James Dolezal and uh, John Frame and some of these other Protestant authors, they're really dealing with this problem. But also, uh, it, it doesn't really come up in Eastern Orthodox and in Catholic dialogue in the commissions that take place, like for instance, in Ravenna or Chieti. Um, but it's still a, it's still an issue that's going to buzz. It's going to brim up to the top sooner or later again, I think. And so it would be good to have a couple of books that we could really consult and to get at least a cursory and an in-depth view. Um, so I'll let Dr. Matava maybe answer that question. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That, that you brought up so many great points there. Um, just before I suggest some, some titles, uh, just to reaffirm what you were saying about analogy, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. And, and I think that the, the tendency is to assume we know how God wills or what God's will operations are like. And then we say, well, then how could it not be necessary? But instead, what we've got to do is start from the created world. And, and what we say about God is governed and limited by what creatures authorize us to say and, and what, what our experience authorizes us to say. Uh, I think a lot of these mistakes creep in uh, when we start assuming that we know what it's like for God to will mm -hmm. uh, and we draw conclusions from our own experience of willing. Um, on creation, um, one, one book that comes to mind, an author who recently deceased, unfortunately, is um, uh, Hugh McCann. And I, 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 if you look up his name, you'll find uh, the right titles. And I don't have, I don't have it right to hand. Um, in fact, let me see. Maybe I do in my notes here on the desk. Uh, I'll, I'll flip through in a second to see. But uh, Hugh McCann, who was a philosopher at Texas A&M University, uh, did a lot of good work on creation, both by way of articles, and there was a book that was published just not many years ago. Um, in fact, it was it came out right after he died, and it was sort of, uh, uh, it came out just before he died. I think, in fact, the title of it is Creation. Uh, there's a subtitle of that, but it's by the University of Indiana Press, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in any case, any of his material that I've seen uh, has been very helpful on this, and it gets into um, how God wills all of the multiplicity of things in this one unitary uh, act of will. Um, he also gives a decent discussion of freedom and how to understand created freedom uh, in light of the divine will. So he's one author I'd recommend. James Ross is another one. Um, his work is largely on his website. Um, he's also, he, he died in 2008. Um, and he's a difficult author to read, but he's brilliant. And I find myself going back to him time again and finding more insight. He's the sort of author you've got to read more than once, and, and you realize there's a lot happening there. Um, he's able to articulate very traditional positions um, in, a, in a contemporary idiom, especially in dialogue with analytic philosophers of religion. Um, but I find him as, as a very originative thinker who's part of his originality is how traditional he is. Uh, given the world he's operating in. He's done some good work on creation, also on, on human freedom. Um, a good readable source, two, two names uh, that, have, that have written good things, uh, including some things that are, uh, that are for a wider audience. Um, Herbert McCabe, an uh, English Dominican father, uh, has some collections of essays that have been published that touch on creation. Those are, are generally pretty helpful. And Brian Davies, uh, has also done some good work on, on creation, on divine simplicity, both in books and in articles. Uh, Brian Davies, who teaches at Fordham. Um, last book that I'll mention that comes to mind is called God, A Philosophical Preface to Faith. It was written by Germaine Grise back in the mid-1970s and then recently re-released around 2005, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, St. Augustine's Press in South Bend. And this is a brilliant book um, that includes not only a discussion of a kind of cosmological argument for God's existence, but also goes into issues about created freedom, analogy, um, the meaningfulness of Christian doctrinal claims. And the core part of this book is a sort of tour de force critique of all the major schools of modern philosophy. Um, it's a book that never seemed to have gotten much press, but it's always puzzled me why it didn't, because it's a... Uh, it's a pretty trenchant argument. And so that too, I think, is a source that would be illuminating if you were looking at uh, creation and, and issues of God's existence. 
Excellent. Well, Dr. Matava, thank you so much for, you know, having this discussion with us today. Um, I hope we didn't keep you too long. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, I, I loved it. And um, this was great. Thank you very much for having me on. It's great to be with you and with Eric. And uh, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. This is the sort of thing that's, that's worth thinking about and worth talking about. And so thanks for the opportunity. And I hope that this is really just the beginning for, for us and for our listeners to be able to uh, explore this mystery more fully. Absolutely. I, I would be honored if you'd be willing to come on and, and talk to us further about not only this topic, but you know, there's, there's plenty others that we could get to if, if you're available. Sure. All right. Good deal. Well, Eric, also, thank you for coming on again. It's always a pleasure. Oh, likewise, Michael. I appreciate it, man. Indeed. Viewers, please comment, like, subscribe, and share this video. And on that note, uh, that, that's it. So God bless you all, and uh, go share your faith.